Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive into Angela Carter's The Magic Toy Shop, published in 1969. Part 2. Preserving Individuality and Identity in Relationships. So there are two big things that I think Melanie has to confront in The Magic Toy Shop. The first one we just talked about in the last part of this video. The second obstacle that Melanie has to overcome is the overwhelming tendency to lose herself or lose her sense of identity in her relationships with the men around her. There are two key relationships with respect to this theme that Melanie has in the book. These are her romantic relationship with Finn and her relationship with Uncle Philip. But before we talk about Melanie, I do want to quickly look at how this theme of identity and preserving your identity in relationships is also discussed in terms of other characters as well. As we'll see in the course of this part, Carter doesn't necessarily think that any relationship that you have will cause your identity to be undermined. But she does certainly seem to think that marriage is something that can destroy someone's identity, and especially the identities of women, who become almost auxiliary to their male partners. We can see this again by returning to our minor characters from the previous part, Mrs. Bundle and Melanie's mother. Now, Melanie's mother is one of the less extreme examples of this. The most extreme example of this is in the character of Aunt Margaret, who is Uncle Philip's wife. We learn in the novel that on the day that she got married, Aunt Margaret became completely silent. She became a mute. And only at the end of the novel, when she rejects Uncle Philip and, you know, abandons that relationship, is she able to find her voice again. She also has to wear this choker around her neck that's always described as being incredibly tight and constricting. It stops her from moving around easily. It stops her from talking. And all of these things, again, metaphorically, are showing how, in marrying Uncle Philip, she has lost her sense of identity, her sense of who she is. She's no longer an individual woman with her own ideas and thoughts. She is basically just a, like one of Uncle Philip's toys, a puppet that he can use as he sees fit. Now, despite this, what's interesting about Margaret is that we find out later on that she has actually been carrying on and having an affair behind um, Uncle Philip's back all this time with her brother, Francie. Now, this is another nice example of what I talked about in the previous part again, because it seems like Margaret is just this passive character, um, but actually, she is actually doing this pretty ballsy thing, having an affair in the same house with her brother and her husband, and getting away with it. So actually it turns out that she's more active than we might think, or we're led to think through the course of the novel. Nevertheless, I still think that this portrayal of Margaret as someone who has lost her voice when she became married, who is constricted by Uncle Philip in this way, is certainly meant to kind of demonstrate this idea that you can lose your sense of identity in marrying someone. So now that we've seen how some of the background characters have this conflict as well, let's turn our attention again to Melanie. Throughout the course of the novel, Melanie is in this constant battle and struggle to maintain her sense of herself in the face of external forces. At the start of the novel, just like with the wedding dress, we have another metaphor which kind of conveys this theme. In this opening passage, Melanie is standing in front of a mirror and she's exploring her body for the first time. Now this might be taken to be a somewhat self, you know, self-realization kind of moment. You know, you're looking at yourself for the first time, it's you that's perceiving your body, not anyone else. But actually we see as this passage goes on, that Melanie standing in front of the mirror starts to construct herself, her identity, the way she sees herself, in relation to how other people might see her. In particular, men who might want to marry her. Further, she used the neck curtain as raw material for a series of nightgowns suitable for her wedding night, which she designed upon herself. She gift-wrapped for a phantom bridegroom, taking a shower and cleaning his teeth in an extra-dimensional bathroom of the future in honeymoon cans. In readiness for him, she revealed a long, marbly white leg up to the thigh. Then, pulling the net tight, she examined the swathed shape of her small, hard breasts. Their size disappointed her, but she supposed they would do. So there's kind of a double-edged sword in this scene. On the one hand, you have Melanie on her own, seeing herself in the mirror, and, you know, coming up with how she wants to be perceived by others. But at the same time, she's doing that, at least to some extent, thinking about how others are going to perceive her and wanting to be perceived a certain way. So her identity is being constructed by other people's eyes, even if not quite literally. Mirrors are actually a thing that crop up several times in the book, and you've got this opening scene with the mirror, Melanie looking at herself in the mirror, and when we get to Uncle Philip's, we find that there are no mirrors in the house, and this is something that Melanie laments, oh, I think, at least two or three times in the course of the book. And again, I think Carter's using this to kind of suggest something about 
the importance of mirrors, or at least the importance of being able as a person to look at yourself and to see how you appear to yourself. It seems like in taking mirrors away from Melanie, Uncle Philip is allowing himself to construct Melanie's identity. He's going to tell her how she should look. He's going to be able to look at her and judge her in a way that she can't do because she can't see herself. So in the opening scene, you have this metaphorical setup of a theme that's going to play out in reality later. And this theme is played out, as I said in the introduction to this part, with respect to Melanie's relationships with Finn, her love interest, and with Uncle Philip. Now, both of these two men try and influence and shape Melanie's identity in different ways. And throughout the course of the novel, Melanie has to struggle against these forces, these two men, to assert herself and identify herself as she wants to. With respect to Finn, Melanie has an incredibly conflicted relationship. On the one hand, she's kind of repulsed and disgusted by this guy who is really unkempt and unclean, but also she's drawn to him and his charisma and his smile, and these feelings constantly fluctuate, sometimes within the span of like a paragraph throughout the book. Melanie's conflicted feelings actually make sense, they're kind of rational, because at least as a reader, it seems pretty obvious in the course of the novel that Finn is potentially someone who could become a new Uncle Philip. Unlike his brother Francie, Finn works for Uncle Philip, he's his apprentice, and he even says at one point that Uncle Philip sometimes lets me pull the strings. And so there is this worry, probably both for Melanie and for us as readers, that Finn may turn out to be just another puppet master like Uncle Philip. Also, both Philip and Finn try and impose themselves on Melanie in two significant scenes. But in both cases, there are salient differences which suggest to me that Uncle Philip is certainly someone who is trying to oppress Melanie and basically just make him into a fantasy of his own making, whereas Finn has ideas about what he would like Melanie to be, but he also has a certain amount of respect for Melanie and her own person. And that's why these two can ultimately... They don't get a happy ever after by any means, but they do end up in a somewhat of a relationship together by the end of the book. So there are two examples of Melanie being imposed on by Uncle Philip and Finn that I want to go through. The first one is a short passage of both men trying to impose their image of how they would like her to appear onto her. You've tied up your hair again, Finn said casually. It's more practical, Melanie said, blushing a little. Ah well, he shrugged, rubbing his eyes to get the sleep out of them. Then he looked Melanie up and down. Then he said violently, No, you can't wear them. What? Trousers. One of your Uncle Philip's ways. You can't abide a woman in trousers. He won't have a woman in the shop if she's got trousers on her and he sees her. He shouts her out into the street for a harlot. Ah, it's dreadful sometimes. Do you realise you're a walking affront to him, Melanie? Melanie, will you slip up and put on a skirt? Or he'll turn you out. Bewildered, she looked down at herself. She was covered. She was proper. He must be joking. Please, he beseeched. He implored. So in the scene, we have Finn noticing that Melanie isn't wearing her hair in the way that he likes, and while he does kind of casually lament that, he doesn't force her to go change her hair, because he respects her at some level. This suggests to me that Finn is a character who is sincere, you know, he's not going to lie about what he likes and what he wants, but at the same time, when it comes to imposing those things on others, at least to some extent, he's willing to let other people be themselves and do what they like. However, when it comes to Uncle Philip, obviously with Finn acting as the conduit for Uncle Philip, because he's speaking on behalf of Uncle Philip, we can see that Uncle Philip does not care about Melanie and her sense of individuality and sense of self. He wants her to look a certain way, and if she does not look that way, he's going to call her a harlot and, you know, turf her out. Because Uncle Philip just doesn't care about Melanie as a person with, you know, an individual right to look how she wants. The fact that Finn is begging Melanie to change for Uncle Philip, but not doing so for himself, really shows you the difference between these two men. But it also does highlight their similarity. Both are similar in that they, to some extent, try and impose something on Melanie, but the difference is Finn seems to have a somewhat respect for Melanie, Uncle Philip doesn't have any respect for anyone that doesn't conform to his standards. Ironically though, when Melanie does go upstairs to put the skirt on, she does actually change her hair for Finn. On impulse, she unplaited her hair and shook it out. The second example that I want to look at are now two different scenes, and these are the two scenes in which both men try and impose themselves physically onto Melanie. Finn does this literally when he kisses Melanie while they're out for a walk, and she does not like this, um, despite 
things before seeming like they're on a date, when it comes to it she rejects it. Philip doesn't actually physically impose himself on Melanie. He does it metaphorically in his play with Leda and the Swan, him being the swan, the phallic swan, you know, attacking Melanie. In both cases, Melanie is not happy with these advances, but again there is a key difference in the two cases. When Finn eventually talks to Melanie about what happened, he demonstrates guilt, remorse, and he's sorry for it. What does Uncle Philip do? Well, he comes downstairs, slaps her across the face, and tells her that she was overacting. In Melanie's relationship with Uncle Philip, she is in this constant battle to maintain her own identity, as Uncle Philip is a character who demands that everyone conform to his standards and his way of not just doing things, but also his way of being. If you're a woman, that's even worse, because it means you have to dress a certain way, look a certain way, and also just not speak. Finn says at one point of Uncle Philip that he likes silent women. He also makes the men in his life conform to his standards, to the point where when Finn irritates him one too many times, he pushes him from a balcony in, while they're doing the puppet play and seriously injures Finn. There's also a similar thing going on with Finn, and I think Melanie's anxieties about Finn and losing her identity in that relationship can come from looking at Finn, looking at the negative aspects of his character. She doesn't really like the fact that he is incredibly grubby and dirty, and possibly is going to be an alcoholic and a mess. You know, she's worried that if she enters a relationship with him, then she will become that as well. She will lose her, you know, her sense of propriety and all that kind of stuff, and devolve into something that she doesn't think is good. Despite this though, I do think the novel ends on a positive note with respect to this theme. Although we don't fully know what happens after the fire, it just ends with Melanie and Finn escaping, and we see them kind of watching the fire go up in flames, but they are described as being there together, and they're going to face the future together, and it seems like there's a sense that they're going to do this on relatively equal terms. Even if, because I don't think Carter's too much of an idealist with these things, she is recognising that there is some ambiguity here. This conflict between partners in a relationship is eternal. You are always going to lose some aspects of yourself in a relationship with someone, and you can't get rid of them. But the thing to do is to avoid entering relationships with Uncle Philip types. You don't want to be in a relationship with someone that's going to consume you and destroy you eventually. And I think that's why Carter prefers the ambiguous ending of the book, because she doesn't want to say for sure that things will be fine in the future. To do that would be to do the thing that all the idiots in the story are doing. It would be to come up with a fantasy about the way the world is, you know, oh and we can all just get on with each other, when actually that's just never fully feasible. There are always going to be power struggles and tensions whether that's between genders, between friends, between family, all of these things that Carter touches on in this book, they're always going to be there and we can't get rid of them. And that's why I think ultimately we get this ambiguous, if somewhat slightly optimistic, ending. Okay, so I've talked about what I think are two of the big themes in The Magic Toy Shop. The first thing that I think The Magic Toy Shop is doing, it's telling us a story about how the stories we tell ourselves about reality are somewhat fantastical, they're not wholly grounded in reality, but they can actually impact the way that we see the world. We see this with Melanie's coming-of-age story, but also with many of the side characters who have these stories in their heads, and these stories in their heads seem to bleed out sometimes into reality, with some terrifying and dangerous consequences. The second big thing that I think the book really gets into, and is probably my preferred theme in the book, is how our relationships with other people, especially our romantic relationships, can actually result in our losing our sense of identity. And Melanie's story is essentially a story of someone going through that struggle. She's trying to carve out, as a maturing woman, who she is, who she wants to be, and she's trying to battle to keep that sense of identity that she's clinging onto from these oppressive forces, whether that's Uncle Philip, who's the big oppressive force, or even just in normal relationships with the people around her. Hopefully then, when you're reading this book for the first time, or for the tenth time, or however many times you've read it watching this video, these are some things that you'll be able to pick up on, and hopefully see more of in the text. Okay, that's it for today's video. Please let me know what you think of this analysis in the comments. This is my first time doing a full-length video doing an analysis of a book, so feedback is very much appreciated at this point, whether that's critical to do with video itself, or if you have some things to say about my analysis of the book, or if you have some things that you think are salient in the book that I haven't picked up on. Please let me know in the comments below what you think. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel, 
I post new videos usually every Monday at 4pm. But that's it for me now though, so take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.